Good evening, everyone. Very warm welcome to this evening's seminar. Uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Minister Schaefer with us today. And I think the context of our engagement follows from the international collaborative project of which this is a part of. Uh, the project partners, we're very pleased our project partners are able to, to be with us here in Cape Town over these three days to discuss how issues of equity <clears throat> in relation to education and the public good are, are, f are framed and being reframed through the lens of different forms of provision. And we're particularly concerned and interested in the implications of public-private partnerships and how this facilitates or not or has challenges in relation to uh, the provision of education as a public good and also <clears throat> healthcare as a public good. So the engagement we're having this evening is part of the, the larger project, the EQUIPS project. It's a, a project that is, uh, as, as I indicated, an international collaborative project that's bringing together scholars from across the globe, specifically from the UK, India, and South Africa, to discuss issues of equity uh, and uh, educational transformation, health transformation, and the implications as they relate to, to public private partnerships, and what we're interested in is an engagement of ideas, but an evidence-based dialogue. So we're looking at the evidence, what the evidence suggests about how opportunities or not are created through the development of these uh, public-private partnerships in, in education. And this element of that engagement is, a, is about a public dialogue to, to start to meaningfully engage some of the underlying issues around understanding the public good, uh, notions of social solidarity, and where we find ourselves at this particular point in attending to the problems, unresolved problems of education and healthcare provision, and the different forms of interventions that can be put in place to secure education and health as a, as a public good. Um, so again, just a very warm welcome extended to, to Minister Schaefer. We're pleased that Minister can be here. Um, and it's also part of a dialogue with, with government and different sec social sectors who have an interest in improving our, our educational system. And again, a very warm welcome also to our international guests from the UK from, and from India. And also very honored to have Professor Elaine Untal to, to give us a keynote speech to address issues of the public good, the common good, and public-private partnerships in education. So, uh, without any further ado, my side, I'll hand over to Prof. Yusuf Sayed, who will actually chair this current session and introduce Elaine and the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Robbie. <laughs> it's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of CPUT and on behalf of the Vice Chancellor and Deputy Vice Chancellor, who understandably have somewhat other pressing priorities right now for those who follow the news. But I think they are very pleased to, that we're having this dialogue and the Faculty of Education represented by Professor Detroit. I think for us, uh, as the Center for International Teacher Education, we're four years old as a research institute dedicated to education policy and teacher education in particular. These seminars are a way of engaging with the broader constituency, governments and other social sectors about the challenges facing South African education, particularly as it relates to equity and transformation. So this is part of an ongoing series of seminars and dialogue. And in particular, we are, from my side, I'm very pleased that Minister Schaefer is here. We're hoping she would have come last time, but unfortunately couldn't be there, and we hope we see more of her and her colleagues from the, DBE, uh, from the WCED and DBE present. So it's not, I don't need to say more at this stage, but to introduce you to our keynote speaker, Professor in, in, Elaine Unterhalter, who's the Professor of Education and International Development, as well as the co-director of the Center for Education and International Development at the Institute of Education, UCL, now part of UCL, <laughs> right? I have to say that because that's formally part of it. Elaine's not unknown to everybody in this audience, in particular in South Africa. Her history of education in South Africa dates as far back as working with Harold Warpy and the RISA project. 
in the early 1990s and late 1980s, and she's continued with that abiding interest in South African education, particularly as it relates to the intersection of race, class, and gender equities and inequities in particular. So we are very pleased that Elaine's here, and we are very pleased that she agreed to do the keynote speaker. So the order is that Elaine will talk for roughly 40 minutes. Then we will invite Dr. Heather Jacklin from UCT to respond, but also to open up some lines of questioning and discussion. And then I'll have, give you a brief chance to come back and add and comment on the presentations. And after that, hopefully, we'll get you home early on time. Anyway, you need to be as long as possible to avoid the Cape Town traffic. So we'll try to make sure that we don't send you out in the notorious Cape Town traffic. So it's my real pleasure to now to ask Elaine to present. Thank you. Shall I go? Okay. Robbie, Robbie and Yusuf spoke about um, using this talk to look at some of the, the big ideas, and it is going to be big ideas. But I think I'm more nervous of you than, um, uh, 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 yeah. Uh, and I said when I was preparing to come, it's much harder to come and talk in South Africa where people know you than if I was going to the other ends of the world where nobody much knew who I was. So um, <laughs> I'm going to read this talk to just deal with my nerves. And um, what I want to do in the talk is put um, three terms that we've been talking about over the last two days in these quite intense seminars we've been having with students and um, uh, colleagues from different places. I want to put these three terms, public good, common good, and public-private partnership in education under a kind of scrutiny. And the scrutiny I'm going to use is partly historical, partly conceptual, and it's going to be framed by some contextual reflection. Um, I'm going to be drawing on a number of publicly funded research projects, and a lot of friends and colleagues who work on those projects are in the audience and will probably ask some hard questions. Um, but I've been working, you know, the, the RISA project with Harold Wolpe actually was started in 1985. So over a very, very long period, I've been working on complex collaborations across different political per perspectives, locations, and experiences. So I'm going to give you a view from inside public education. Um, but I'm conscious that public education is not equal education or um, even at present untainted by elements of marketization, much more reminiscent of the private sector. So in the UK and South Africa where I've worked and lived, um, public higher education is entangled with many historical inequalities and forms of public-private provision um, amplify this. So some of the context you're framing is I'm going to going to use is historical, and I'm going to draw out this long view. Um, it's partly because my intellectual training is as a historian, but I'm really turning to history to try to understand some perplexing features of the present um, and the complexity of the public and the private. Okay, my long view starts in 2016, and it goes backwards. Um, 2016 is widely regarded as a year of disjunctures, possibly signaling an end of many of the institutions that mark the 20th century. Some example of end points are the aerial bombardment of civilians in Aleppo. Attacks of that form had not been seen since World War II. The war in Syria contributed to enormous numbers of refugees crossing the world, again reaching figures not seen since the 1940s. The outcome of the Brexit referendum in the UK called into question the post-war European project, in the same way that the election of Donald Trump as president of the USA called into question particular assumptions about national and foreign policy in that country. The decision of the USA and Israel to withdraw from UNESCO while I was writing this talk have only amplified my sense of endings. What is interesting about all these events is that they were generally not predicted. They were shocking partly because they were unexpected. 
Um, Adam Tooze, in an article published in Prospect last year, it's a kind of uh, popular philosophical journal in the UK, compared 2016 and 1917. In 1917, he wrote, three similarly world-shattering but unexpected events took place in ways ushering in the 20th century. Lenin took a train from Zurich back to Russia, a decisive move in the history of Bolshevik leadership of the Russian Revolution. Woodrow Wilson, who had pledged American neutrality at the beginning of World War I, decisively entered the war in Europe and began a chapter, chapter of American global interventionism. Gandhi, who had returned to India from South Africa in 1915, began the movement of peasants, farmers, and urban laborers that was to build towards the anti-colonial and national movements that successfully came to challenge colonial rule in Asia, Africa, and indeed across the world. We could multiply these events, these significant events of 1917, and I've strikingly absent for me from Tuza's article was any reference to um, uh, the emancipation of women and women's, the women's suffrage movement at, in that year. Um, but I've, since I read the article last year, I've been very interested to uncover what the education ideas were that were circulating in 1916 and what light they could throw on understanding the public good and what perspective they give us on public-private partnerships. So I want to build from this long perspective of more than 100 years across a century to try and disentangle some of those ideas. So here are three education ideas circulating in 1916. It's not a comprehensive list. Um, the South African novelist and woman rights campaigner Olive Schreiner had been a close friend of Eleanor Marx and outspoken critic of Rhodes's invasion of Zimbabwe. In 1916, she made a speech in London to the Union of Democratic Control and the Non-Conscription Relationship. And sorry, this is not a good, um, but there she is, a fellowship. She, she invoked many hundreds of thousands who have not desired war and who are determined that when the peace comes, it shall be a reality and not a hotbed for the raising of future wars. And then she went on to say, we feel that as the governments have made the wars, the peoples themselves must make the peace. We are organizing ourselves that when the time comes, we may be able effectively to act. Our second aim is to educate ourselves and others to this end. So this vision of education, made despite the actions of warmongering governments and uniting people themselves, partly because of their capacity to educate themselves, is a hopeful vision of common good, achieved by public processes in which education plays a major role. This idea has a long pedigree and was one of the ways in which Enlightenment celebration of rationality had come to be associated with morality and to underpin social policy about the importance of expanding education provision. The idea about education connecting the hearts of people who wished for peace in the shadow of war was to find its way into the preamble of the Constitution of UNESCO, which reads, since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. Um, that's that old-fashioned meaning of men that I think meant men and women. We see here a strong identification of education in all forms with common good. The notion of common good here is that used by Simon Marginson in his new book on higher education, where common good, he explains, is a form of open solidaristic engagement. I think it's what Robbie in uh, a presentation this morning was um, uh, call it, calling universal social, universalized social citizenship. Um, Marginson um, sees that idea of solidaristic engagement and common good. He associates it with the idea of fraternity in the uh, French Revolution slogans, liberty, equality, fraternity. And I think Schreiner would probably be 
disturbed by that with her strong sense around women's rights. Um, she would probably deploy a different term. For her, the sense is associated with the notion that the widest access must be given to a large public to participate in education, both contributing to and benefiting from the common good and building the defenses of peace. Okay, so that's Schreiner. Here's a second writer who was writing in 1916, um, also in London at the time, uh, Salt Plachy. An eminent linguist writer and acute observer was to play a key role in the founding of the ANC. Um, Plachy published Native Life in South Africa in 1916. This was an account of the dispossession, poverty, and distress associated with the, uh, native, the 1913 Land Act, the South African Land Act. The book was published in London and widely circulated, partly through networks of African-American educators like W.E. Dubois. The work is a trenchant criticism of poverty, inequality, and colonial rule. A key idea is how the views of Africans in South Africa are not represented and the voices of people who have direct experience of the effects of colonial and racism are not heard. Um, in fact, that extract over there, um, which I might not have time to talk about, is a strong evocation of um, Plaki's identification and disidentification with Britain and, and under the shadow of war and the feeling of peace. But I just wanted to um, read you uh, um, another extract where, where he took, oh, I'm not, which I'm not going to be able to find under stress. He talks about how people invoke the views of people in South Africa, but never go and talk to them. So the Native Land Act is promoted and people report on the um, uh, views of people in South Africa, but nobody ever asks the views or reads the press coming out of the places where people are located. Um, and for Plaki, it is the failure of policymakers to talk to and engage with the people who experience the decisions of colonial rulers that drive some of the dispossession and injustice he depicts. He is appalled that the terrible suffering of World War I has not generated a sense of peace building for the common good. So he's, where Shrine is stressing coming together, he's stressing how inequalities are replicated. And a third um, education idea, also published in 1960, comes in the writings of John Dewey, who published Democracy and Education that year. Dewey's core idea, which was to be so definitive of much of the 20th century, was the school was the place where the personal and the social connected, where democracy as a lived relationship between people could be fashioned, and where a democratic citizenship that took mutuality and equality seriously could be fashioned. And that's a key passage from um, uh, his Democracy and Education. For Dewey, common good was not entirely natural. It's not located in the hearts of men and women, in Shriner's words. For Dewey, common good has to be constructed, and the school as a public institution was one means to do this. Thus, Shriner invokes as a common good, while Plaiki is acutely aware of the inequality and relationships of colonialism that make common good difficult to sustain. For him, education, discussion, the use of the press can form insight to generate understandings of public good for change, associated, for example, with addressing poverty. Dewey is more explicit about how schools and teachers might work for public and common good. For Schreiner, Plaki, and Dewey, a key shared assumption is that education is a public project. Um, and at the end of our seminar this afternoon, uh, Heather Jacklin posed the question, what is the public? Um, and I, I'm going to try to uh, answer that question a little bit through looking at these writers. But um, for all those three writers, it's a project that happens despite the actions of contemporary governments, which all three see as failing to support or provide adequately for the appropriate kinds of knowledge and forms of education for certain groups of people. Dewey and Plaki argue education 
appropriate for democracy could be supported by government. But they note how the support of government is often neglectful, linked with race and class assumptions. All three had experiences of different kinds of private education, often linked with religious organizations. But for all three, privately organized education enterprise does not seem to be relevant to their vision of education. So the question I want to pose, it's taken me a long time to get here, is why and how has the private come to be seen to, as to be an important contributor to public good in education in our times? So I want to fast forward from these generally hopeful delineations of education in 1916 to the present. And I acknowledge that for the sake of my argument, I'm not mentioning a host of other arguments around education and public goods circulating in 1916, some of which stressed obedience and hierarchy, some noted dark features of the Enlightenment and formulations of common goods, um, some of the very offensive ideas of nationalism would be examples of that, and some of which acknowledged the complexity and difficulties of mixing education ideas about public and private, the work of Freud or people dealing with the unconscious might be examples of that. I selected Schreiner, Plachi, and Dewey because they give particular visions of public good and common good that seem helpful in relation to thinking about the unanticipated arrival of the features of the 20th century noted in Tuza's article. So I try to locate them to those three key events. But now I want to turn to our own times. What are some ideas about education circulating at the moment that might help us frame the events of last year, which appear so epoch-changing? Okay, here are three, and I'm sure you can add more. And in fact, I wrote this before spending two days listening to the incredible creativity and um, thoughtfulness of people who've attended these two days of meetings. So. Yeah, this, this is blunt, you know, and I will revise it after today. But anyway, there are three on the table for you to tear apart. <laughs> um, firstly, there's the idea that I'd heard attributed to some large philanthropic capitalists, and uh, Yusuf um, and Terence have also spoken about them, um, that you, can, you need to think about education as taking an aeroplane. You can fly first class or on a budget airline, but whatever way you go, you get to your destination. It is clear that in this form of the argument, public good or public goods or common good, and Simon Marginson distinguishes these three notions, or, and the public sphere, the notion that education is a sphere from which one can critique a range of uh, social, political, cultural arrangements, that argument, um, the, the flying by aeroplane argument, it doesn't matter what that end point is um, because you're, it can be achieved instrumentally by a range of means. This could include private provision in elite private schools as low fee private schools or public private partnerships. In this argument, the means is less important than the ends. So in the work I've done with colleagues, a number of whom are in this room, and the ESRC, Newton Fund, NRF-funded project on higher education and the public good in four African countries, we've identified a group of arguments that stress the instrumental role of higher education in relation to the public good. Our analysis highlights that for writers who deploy these arguments, higher education can be portrayed as instrumental in shaping a vision of the public good. It is perceived to lead to particular manifestations of public good delineated as economic, uh, higher income growth, social, um, political, or cultural. Thus, an expansion of higher education can be shown to be associated with economic growth for particular societies or regions political engagements and expanded provision of both market-based and non-market goods. The meaning of public good in this form of argument can be linked with better health, inclusive government, or more sustainable environment. Different levels of public good are invoked, individual, community, or even global uh, public goods. And there's an illusion going on, I think, that public equals state 
um, or some form of um, the aura around the state. And good means just and right. Um, the notion is that higher education, which rests on good basic in education, is instrumentally associated with these developments, whether or not a causal relationship can be demonstrated. The argument made here is that education increases public goods or public good over time. In this form, there is nothing special about education as a public site. Thus, for instrumental arguments, it is clear, and this point is made often by advocates of private schools and private universities, by public higher education institutions that recruit disproportionately from private schools, as is the case in elite Russell Group universities in the UK, and by supporters of various kinds of public-private partnerships, that public good at a range of levels can be re produced regardless of the form of education institutions, be these public, private, or some mix. There is nothing in the instrumental argument that says only public institutions can be linked with increasing local, national, and global public good. Public or private institutions, or PPPs, are to be evaluated because of their outputs. What public good flows, regardless of the form of input or the public-private processes associated with generating outputs or outcomes. Public good is here often linked or used interchangeably with common good. There is a lack of precision where the one elides with the other. Education is a public good, which is a form of the co common good. It's just the kind of the one blends into the other and there's no precision. Okay, I've, sorry, I neglected my slides. Um, now I can't make them move. Okay. So that's the instrumental argument. Okay, a second current critique, a second current in the education ideas at the moment critiques this instrumental view that sees education means, experiences, or processes as largely irrelevant to public good. This critical view See, notes the form of education provision is likely to reflect and reproduce the inequalities within the society or the global polity. Unless this is explicitly challenged or managed reflexively, we cannot simply assume an unproblematic public good will be generated by education institutions that reproduce destructive inequalities. To take the aeroplane analogy, whether you travel first class or economy may have considerable bearing on how you are treated and experience your journey, view your destination, and what happens to you when you get there. For writers on this theme, and I am one of them, education provision is marked by intersecting inequalities, and this has considerable bearing for how one thinks about how to define public good and common good. The amount and form of what is deemed private and why has considerable salience. Different writers taking this perspective note a range of intersecting inequalities of race, class, gender, and location. A range of politics and different state and institutional formations frame the ways in which ideas about education and the public good and its similarity or difference from the common good are framed, contested, negotiated, traded off, evaluated, and contextualized. Um, and I think this was some of what Robbie was referring to when he spoke this morning about um, thinking about the ways in which you create a, um, a shared sense of social citizenship. It's not natural. There's a great deal of politics associated with this. In the Higher Education and Public Good Research Projects in Africa, we have we pointed to a host of studies which note the intellectual, physical, and cultural experiences enabled through higher education to express and enact the public good, but these are generally small-scale local studies. Thus, education is a site for enacting features of the public good, in particular spaces, which are sometimes referred to as the public sphere, of open debate, information exchange, reflective pedagogies, knowledge formation. However, these spaces can be fragile, put under threat, or can be enriched by cultures of openness, hybridity, interdisciplinary flows, or multiple voices. 
This connects with movements which question and seek to change intersecting inequalities, exclusions, and forms of exploitation and oppression. In this argument, public good and, and critically reviewed notion of common good is central to the experience of education. It really does matter whether education institutions are associated with forms of fair employment and decent work, which is not increasingly becoming the case in the UK with a lot of um, uh, weak contracts for academic staff in what's called the gig economy. That certain values of equality and fairness govern research, teaching, and administration. Relationships with institutions locally, nationally, and internationally have a bearing on intrinsic forms of the public good. Forms of privatization, hierarchy, and exclusion will distort the intrinsic public good dynamic of education, and they need to be kept under rigorous scrutiny. Okay, so that's the second contemporary idea. This is the third idea, which I'm... Oh, all right. I have... I'll... Oh, sorry, back to that one. Um, forms of private accumulation of income and wealth undermine this. Okay, Thomas uh, Piketty's analysis, um, which has had enormous influence in people talking about capital and income, draws out how the feature of the last 30 years has been an increasing growth, has been an increasing growth in returns on capital. And that growth on the returns on capital far outpaces the growth in returns on income. It is this, he argues, that has driven the widening inequalities in income and wealth in so many countries, as well as globally, resulting in some shocking statistics. For example, that three South African billionaires own assets that exceed that of 50% of the South African population, or that eight men who can fit in a golf buggy have wealth equivalent to that of 3.6 billion people in the, world, in the poorest half of the world. Um, Piketty only comments on economic capital and earned incomes. However, I think you can extend the meaning of capital to take on intellectual and social capital. If we look at the positional advantages associated with attending or working at one of the global or national superpower universities, and I think UCL likes to think of itself as one of those, or in one of the high status disciplines, Current ways of ranking returns mean that the rate of growth in status far exceeds that associated with the returns from study or professional work in lower ranked institutions. And indeed, inequalities between institutions are increasing. And um, Sharman gave us a really interesting example of this in the, in, in, in the uh, description of the changes in higher education in India earlier this afternoon. If we look at figures like citation, publication, research investment, we see increasing inequality despite considerable rhetoric on the importance of South-South learning or listening to local voices. This widening inequality places the notion of higher education and common good under considerable strain. Simon Marginson's book notes how in the UK and the USA, support to remain in the EU and vote against Trump were disproportionately higher amongst those who were university educated with a more global outlook. More recent researchers nuanced this a bit and we could talk about that in the questions. Um, but the point Marginson brings out, which I've tried to deploy in relation to Piketty's argument, is that higher education may expand some forms of public good for some individuals and segments of a society, but the link between unequal higher education and the common good cannot be assumed. It has to be consciously put in place, maintained and kept under review in the same way that you need to um, tax capital or find ways of taxing capital to redress that uh, imbalance between capital and income that he notes. So this brings me to the third contemporary idea, which I want to present as an amalgam of feminist and other counter-hegemonic ideas which question the notion of what is public, what is private, and that deploys some aspect of a communitarian or solidaristic views of care, invokes some aspects of solidarity, and formulate an idea of common good 
that questions the form of contemporary institutions and the relationships of hierarchy and exclusion. And it's this idea that was the least formed before I came to the seminar and I hope will now be very nourished by the work of doctoral students and others who I've heard presenting over the last two days. To summarize, the three education ideas concerned with public and common good I've reviewed could be described as one, the causation idea. That is, that education brings about public good and thus will enhance the conditions for common good. That's the first version. The second is I call the conditional idea. Conditions in education may enhance public good together or separate from common good, but only under certain conditions in certain contexts. And then the third is the critical communitarian or solidaristic idea. We can develop the relationships of care and community by enhancing the quality of relationships between people, which will generate common good, and through this possibly deepen experiences of public good. Um, the ideas I presented from Schreiner, Plaki, and Dewey in 1916 were all in their time counter-hegemonic ideas with a kind of organic connection to the movements that came to define the 20th century. Uh, the three ideas I've outlined above are different. The conditional idea may explain, as Marginson has done for the UK and USA, why the referendum results in the presidential election went the way they did. At a pinch, it may explain some of the failures to deliver on public good associated with attempts at the dismantling of post-war multilateral architecture and inadequate actions on humanitarian crisis. But I'm always doubtful of an argument that has too much explanatory weight. We still have to explain why the causation argument so often lacks the political economic clout to make it happen despite having a great deal of statistical information to support it, and why the communitarian argument cannot generally move from the local to the national and the global. We have, and, and that those are political, not just intellectual problems. We have to engage, I think, with the possibility that features of education may be associated with the public bad, forms of marketized individualism, and orientations that pull in two directions, appearing to lead towards social justice while wrenched in other directions. And it's here that I found the proliferation of PPPs in education particularly fascinating. Robbie or Yusuf, I'm going to go to PPPs now, but can you give me a, 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 a how am I on, is the time okay? Okay. Um, in some work I've done linked to our EQUIPS network and with a number of people who are in the room um, in various guises, I've looked at the ways in which gender equality and women's rights are positioned in policy texts concerned with girls' education, PPPs, public-private partnerships. The argument made is that these documents exemplify an oscillation between pragmatic initiatives that recognize existing sites of power and attempts to develop a political project that dissolves differences between public and private constituencies who share an interest in getting girls into school, a position uh, which is particularly important as a cause of the common good. Um, I've investigated the potential and limits of this approach to support an integrated policy around rights and equalities in education. And I've used the example of Difford's Girls Education Challenge, which is a very large aid package to um, I think 17 countries around the world. In critiquing the implementation of this large aid package, I've elaborated a political and epistemological process which I've termed dispersal. And I've used to consider some ways to investigate the PPPs as mechanisms to address intersecting inequalities, which are both appear to address but ultimately fail to engage with substantive intersecting inequalities. And just to exemplify this for you, I want to show you this picture, if I can. Okay. If you look at this picture, which um, you might not be able to see clearly, but you would be forgiven for thinking it was a demonstration of women's rights activists. The um, 
uh, posters read, history is her story, free freedom, um, votes for women, and women first. In fact, it's not a demonstration by women. It was a um, catwalk show, the Chanel catwalk show, about three years ago, when an industry notorious for the appalling treatment of women, those who work in um, making clothes, advertising clothes, the way uh, uh, um, women are cast because of, uh, are forced to starve themselves to be cast to be models in these shows. Um, so an industry that is replete with sexism and dominated by uh, very oppressive notions of uh, work, of beauty, of culture, appropriated this uh, image of women's rights and women's rights activism and used it to sell clothes. And so it's this kind of image that I want to capture with dispersal, that a social justice project, women's rights, um, is appropriated as part of an advertising campaign. And um, it's extremely confusing about what's public and what's private. So dispersal entails talking public good and common good while walking either pragmatically or complicitly this, with those who have very different agendas. I want to briefly expand on education PPPs. Um, since the 1990s, PPPs have been advocated to enhance the provision of education in the global north and south. And a range of different kinds of partnership are entailed, including public sector contracts with the private sector to deliver core components of the education or support services, publicly subsidized education in private schools through vouchers or other financial arrangements, philanthropy in a range of guises spanning policy advocacy and building of public schools and governance mechanisms, which include collaborations between government, profit, and non-profit third sector organizations. There's not a single way that PPPs link with work on gender equality in education, partly because the concept of gender itself is so fluid, as is the concept of PPPs. So PPPs, if you look at the scholarship on it, have been lauded as offering girls opportunities for schooling denied by standard public provision in developing countries. They've been cautiously considered because of potential to support advocacy around equalities and enhanced service in Africa and South Asia. And they've been criticized as deepening gender inequalities by diminishing the state's capacity to support gender equality frameworks in India. Charges against PPPs in India and Pakistan include the employment of low-paid women teachers and ambiguous signals on gender equality and secondary education. Um, in an evaluation of DFID's work on education, gender equality, and women's empowerment in a range of developing countries, this is a 2005 evaluation, um, Two scholars, Rose and Subramanian, uh, argue that private providers, sometimes working in partnership with the state, encompass initiatives for better quality services reserved for those who can pay, and projects which offer last chance opportunities for the poorest where insufficient school places are available. Public policy on gender equality and girls' education can thus be supported or diluted by PPPs. There's nothing in the form of the PPP that tells us, that says it's public good or not. So PPPs appear as key instances of dispersal, which I'm trying to capture in that picture. And the ideas which are used to argue for their effectiveness show how this framework operates, both in shaping relationships of policy practice and research. Dispersal as a framing has a number of features. Firstly, a particularly fluid meaning assigned to gender, public, and common good. Secondly, oscillations between a pragmatic politics of power and a heterodox engagement with divergent politics of voice. So very often um, in PPPs, in work around PPPs, there's the voice of the single girl this, uh, becomes the image. Um, um, Thirdly, a form of education that is confusingly both part of the problem and part of the solution to widening global inequalities. 
Diffel's Girls' Education Challenge and the form of PPPs involved provide examples of all these features of dispersal. Some focus simply on getting girls into school. Others show some concern to work with communities to examine ideas about gender. In my own discussions with GEC partners at meetings, conferences, on field visits, I've heard a wide range of understandings expressed encompassing some seeing this work as advocating for equalities, while for others it entails ensuring girls are kept clean or away from teenage sex. Sorry, I have left out this, the Differed Girls Education Challenge does not work with the state. So it's 37 million pounds of um, aid money, but it's only to be spent um, with NGOs working on girls' education. Thus, the orientation to equalities or women's rights is sometimes present and sometimes absent. Some commentators on transnational feminism note our policy has moved away from the integrated focus of the Beijing platform to more superficial engagements with aspects of women's employment or girls' education. Dispersal as a framework generally entails a kind of double entendre about politics, which provides a perspective on why it's difficult to make a definitive judgment about PPPs, which appear to offer much as a win-win, harnessing the best of both public and private, but confusingly do not always deliver, as some of the evaluations of GEC uh, illuminate. So, uh, GC, which was driven, did all the things that Diffid wanted through the pub, uh, through the private sector, um, has not delivered the um, addressing marginalisation that was claimed for it. But it's being recommissioned another five years, five years or four, three years. PPPs thus entail a plurality of ideological, organisational, and material engagements with addressing marginalisation, girls' schooling, gender equality, and common or public good. Often substantive issues that talk to concerns of women's rights in the realm of public social policy reform are overlooked for addressing an immediate need to get girls into school. This resonates with approaches to addressing health needs or poverty that have gone for the most immediate intervention, for example, the inoculation, the malaria net, or the cash transfer, rather than detailed understandings, connected forms of, it, of inequalities and dispossession, and developing integrated programs critically engaged with ideas of common good and public good to address these. We cannot read off from the organizational form of PPPs whether they are in themselves good or bad for gender equality, girls schooling or advancing a women's rights agenda. We can make some links between them and causal condition and nil and communitarian forms of the education and public good arguments, but it's always going to be quite contextual. Assessments have to be made in context, taking adequate account of the views of those affected by the interventions. A feature of dispersal as a framework is the way policy advocacy tends to float away from the detail of what is actually happening, to whom, where, and for what reasons. PPPs may, under some circumstances, offer one small part of this um, project, but I have considerable doubts in relation to the examples I've studied. Much more investigation is needed, and one of the features of the work on PPPs that come out of our project is being how much... Uh, advocacy around them is ideological and how little research underpins them. And the work on girls' education challenge is one example of that. Oh, so they, sorry, there were slides here telling you what girls' education challenge were, but in case anyone wants. Okay, this is my conclusion. I'm afraid this is what it looks like. I don't know. It's an inflection point. It's a raised shoulder. It's open hands. Um, and I think it's, um, you know, turning to you and the need to listen. I've sketched three versions of ideas about education, public good, and common good circulating in the education circles I move in. Two are quite hopeful and one sceptical, but I'm unsure. I think the big educations of our times, the kind of equivalent of um, Schreiner, Plaki, and Dewey maybe, uh, are, are not in this room. Uh, I think they are appearing as slogans painted on a wall in a refugee settlement. I think they're almost certainly not being expressed in English. 
but I think we will only be able to be alert to them if we take a critical view of our current vocabularies about public, private, or common good using a longer view. Thanks. So, my brief from my colleagues was that I tried to draw together some strands from our discussions this morning and maybe try to make some links to this evening. Um, so, very briefly, this morning we heard a number of what I thought were really um, valuable contributions. And international perspectives, which I think we need to hear here because we tend to forget that our experiences are not unique. About the entanglements of the public and the private. About how these work in a very wide range of ways. So people use phrases like you have privatization of, you have privatization in, which is public um, organizations which um, borrow ways of doing things from the, pub, from the private or from business often. You also have public as a resource for the private. So you have schools, um, but the schools become places where things, uh, where, for example, other organizations can make money from what? From selling textbooks. Uh, and from doing a range of other things. So you have a number of forms of privatization, or of private, and of the relationship between the private and the public, both in education and in health. I do tend to slip into education only. I apologize to the health people. My head is in education. But um, some very important and interesting uh, contributions were made around how this works in health as well. So what is clear is that we've never had only public, we've never had only private, we've never had a clear line between the two, but nevertheless, in all that entanglement, we're seeing a shift, and that it's interesting to try to map what that shift is, what it means, and what the implications are for all of us, for, if you like, the public good. But listening to Elaine, we can put after that whatever that means. <laughs> and I think that's a very, very important question, by the way. Some of the contributions this morning drew our attention from um, actual case studies in different countries, in Africa and in India, to how many of the current forms of public-private entanglements um, have actually not fulfilled their promises of greater equality and have arguably led, if anything, to greater inequality. And what we also started seeing something of is how not only um, are the promises not necessarily fulfilled and the experiences so far suggest that to be the case, but in fact often what, what also results is that what we have of the public is undermined or dismantled um, in this relationship, in this entanglement. So the private does not supplement or enhance the public, rather it undermines it. Now, I'm putting that fairly simply and simplistically, but I think in the broader possible terms, that was the message that I heard from the uh, contributions this morning. However, we remain the, there remains the problem. Um, are we implying then that the public sector as it is, in the case of schoolings, public schools as they are, government schools as they are, should be left alone to continue to be as they are. And as soon as we ask the question in that way, we realize that that clearly is not, not the goal. So if something has to change, if this particular approach is not um, the way to change it, if bringing 
shifting public-private relations in particular ways is not achieving the goal of, of um, better education and of greater equality what the, in what is the way forward. Um, Robbie Fennickerk in particular offered us the idea of a univer universalist approach and gave us some pointers, which I certainly don't have the time to go into now, about what, what that might involve, particularly in health. I think one of the points that emerged for me particularly clearly is that however we move forward, um, we need to do it against our current conditions in this place, which is of course located in a much greater, greater global place. Uh, in this time, against this history, with these resources, in an environment where the idea of the education as a market has become almost taken for granted and almost difficult to unpack and question. And if against this we are not clear what we mean by the public good that we want to defend, then it's really difficult for us to move forward. And this is where Elaine comes in by helping us to begin then to say, well, what, what meanings might we have? And one of the messages I take for, from her is that, again, the meanings are specific to time and place. They shift over time and place. And that's where historians always are particularly helpful to us, that they remind us that um, we can learn from understanding what happened in 19... Uh, 16, but in 2017, we have to think again. And so that, I think, is a challenge to us. We have to think again. We have to ask what these terms mean for us now. And Elaine began to offer some pointers in this direction, which I, for one, found extremely helpful. So how, then, do we reimagine the public good against the grain of a discourse that understands both health and education in very particular ways. And in the case of education, sees it um, as preparing learners for place in the labor market, primarily. Um, how against that, where, uh, where we also see learners as offering the potential, the schooling of these learners as offering the potential of profit not necessarily for the schools themselves or those who manage the schools, but often for those around them. How then do we start thinking about what schooling should offer, what the public good means? If it goes beyond employability, um, Elaine says to us that it means, for example, the way we relate to each other, the kinds of futures that we can imagine, not only, but also in the workplace. So I was asking myself what I thought this really meant for me, and I thought of a particular, let's say, imagined instance. So imagine with me, in conclusion, a school where the learners are poor, they come from poor homes, um, most of the parents are unemployed, um, they are often hungry. They come into the school and there's a decision being taken around what the language of instruction should be in that school. It's a primary school, so it's from grade one. Most of the learners in this hypothetical example um, come from homes where the language is, is it closer. There are people in the school who, I'm sure with the best intentions possible, believe that the best decision for these learners is that they learn in English only from day one across the curriculum. They think this will um, help the learners certainly finally to move through what in the case of this school has become a very narrowed down restricted and scripted curriculum to the point where at least they can be employed unlike a very large percentage of people in this country. So, we might say, is this the right decision? But that's not the question I want to ask you. I want to ask you, who gets to ask whether it's the right decision? Who, who gets to um, deliberate about it? Um, who has the right to challenge the decision that was taken? 
Um, so here's a question. Who is responsible for the outcomes of that decision? And for me, one of the key questions that we have to ask ourselves is, in the way we are reconfiguring the relationship between the public and private today, are we saying that for you and me, it is none of our business what decision is taken? If you think the right decision is taken, good. If you think the wrong decision is taken, there's no space for you to deliberate. And if the wrong decision is taken in a way that hurts those learners, nobody takes responsibility outside of that site where the decision was taken. Because the, we have a reconfiguration of our schooling system in such a way that those decisions can be taken in that isolated way and the rest of us don't see it as part of our responsibility and part of our task to think about those decisions. And I use the language example because it's a real one. But in a different time and place, it could be whose responsibility is that? Is it that guards, that um, what street people take kids across the street are also raping the kids? Um, which is, of course, we know another real example. Whose responsibility is it? to think about the fact that the curriculum has been completely narrowed down and scripted. Um, is it our business to think and deliberate about these? And what mechanisms do we have for saying, we are all responsible? There's Elaine's word, mutuality. And that's partly what I take from some of the terms that Elaine uses. Care in relations, mutuality. Care, having, having responsibility for each other and for the kind of decisions we take about the future we have. Can we take away from those learners their mother tongue, in effect? And can some manager in a school do it without you and me also saying, what has this cost? Was it the right decision? Was it the wrong decision? And we have a way of intervening or of expressing what we think. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Heather, and thank you, Elaine. We've had really good, a good keynote and some very thoughtful reflections. I think it would be fair just to have a quick round of comments or questions. I'm certain there's a lot to process, but I'm certain there's a lot of you who would like to engage. So the floor is open for people who want to either make a comment or ask a question. Go ahead. So... Thanks. I just want to, on your last point, I mean, I just, I mean, this, the system is such that the governing body of the school decides on the language policy. But what I want to ask you is, who do you think should make that decision? Because you might think you've got the right answer, and your colleague might think she's got the right answer, and the education department might have another view, and the parents might have another view. Uh, so who do you think should actually make that decision? Because certainly we as a government are very open to listening to people's points of view. Hi, thanks. Um, just on that last point, Heather, um, also, uh, just to bring that to BPPs and how the private sector's role in education re reconfigures who actually has voice um, uh, in those processes, whether it's that choice or uh, what's in a textbook or, you, you know, uh, which language textbooks should be in and how the private sector can circumscribe that. Um, uh, Elaine, your point about context, um, and you seem to imply that the evaluation of the validity of, or, 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 or the wisdom of a PPP is context specific. Um, and, and there were two thoughts w which troubled me about that. The first is that sometimes we think, and I'm not sure you meant this, but we think about the evaluation of a, uh, in a, a, a past tense way, right? So we need to actually implement these things first and then do a context evaluation of it. And that allows people to declare good intent, but actually implement something which, which might be uh, uh, harmful if we think about evaluation as a past tense thing. The other thing which bothered me about context was that um, 
Context can ignore the fact that there's underlying logics, that irrespective of a, a context, a private sector may have various interests. Um, uh, and that there's actually logics w which transcend context. Um, context can also be deployed in the opposite way. For example, that uh, a failing public system is used uh, as an excuse. Um, uh, so anyway, I, I just wanted to hear your, um, your thoughts about that. I thanks. Um, I'd like to link um, Heather's last point about who gets to intervene and in what kind of context we get to intervene with uh, this with Prof Unterhalter's view about the advocacy of PPCs is largely ideological. In an early iteration of, the, of, the, of this PPP network, uh, one of the issues that, that arose was that uh, does our responses as advocates of the common good or public good are often needing to be framed in, uh, in terms of pragmatism rather than an ideological response. I'm very keen to hear your, does your thoughts, both thoughts, in terms of our responses as advocates of the public good, and if there are examples of those internationally that we can adopt, or not adopt, but that can inform our practice in, you know, in South Africa, I suppose. Okay, I'll take one more command in front, and in front, yes, this way in front, and then I'll get to Elaine and Adam, and then we'll see if we've got more time to come back on it. But I don't think Elaine and Heather only needs to answer a lot of people who probably have anything else to answer about. Thank you both so much for what you said because it really needed to be said and it's great. Um, I just, I don't want to labor on the language issue, but I think it's a really important example that you made, Heather, because it speaks, it makes an inroad into the question of not just responsibility, but public space itself. And the fact that that space has been so eroded and so devolved down to the individual that we actually cannot have these conversations in spaces other than an academic space, where it is invited, where it is framed within a very particular boundary that excludes a lot of people. So it's not just about thinking about responsibility in terms of who is responsible for decision making, but who's involved in decision making processes. And so we get into these conversations about how it's really hard to have everybody involved, it's really hard to bring people in, stakeholder this, stakeholder that, but it's a very simple conversation about how we need to consider who takes ownership over public goods and who takes ownership over the processes into which children are socialized. Um, I think that that's really also an important sort of bigger question, idea thing that came out for me. Okay. Um, so I'm kind of going to start in the middle in um, with Gilad's point and maybe work out from that because I think the argument I'm um, it's implicit so it's the fact that no one got it is uh, is not is, is not a uh, it's because I didn't explain it. Um, but I, I see the normative question the, is, is, what, is what needs to frame the evaluation. So the evaluations are generally pre presented as highly pragmatic and as, um, uh, you know, you tie to the terms of reference. But if we, we recalibrate it, that evaluation is normative, so those questions, who deliberates, when, and how long, and over what time, because the, if you're going to make a pragmatic decision about the language of instruction in that classroom for that child at that time, and those decisions have implications over a lifetime. I was talking to uh, somebody this morning who told me about her, her, her schooling where her father had decided she, she grew up in Soweto, but her father decided that she should not talk the vernacular language even at home, and she's lost her own language. The, the, the kind of absolute tragedy and poignancy of that story, is, you know, it's, I'm still thinking about it eight hours later. Um, but so that, 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 that what is a pragmatic decision? Get a job next week as a uh, next year. That might that might be the right decision at that time. It might be the long decision over the long term. And I think only normative kinds of framings around. That's where so rights and 
good and justice, all of these questions are, are, are highly abstract and seem to float free from the, uh, the place of practice. And yet I think we do need to sort them out because that very real decision of the school manager, of the teacher, we, ne we need to have taken time to think that. And it's not a decision that one lonely into uh, a group of scholars can take. I think that's the point of you know, it has to be a, a public discussion. It has to be a discussion that's alert to many, many things, and but then draws on what we know about deliberation and what makes good deliberation, and really does praise some of those normative values of mutuality or solidarity and social justice and equality. Places those very centrally, not just the short-term evaluation. Oh. Now, I'm tempted to say what she said. <laughs> but perhaps I'll just add a little bit of, uh, in response to the, 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 the question about so who should decide. Um, well, firstly, we say SGBs get to decide, but actually not, for example, according to the bill in, collabora in what they call collaboration schools. SGBs don't get to decide that kind of question. Um, so that, that's one point. But perhaps that's not the biggest point. It's just that that is, in a way, too easy an answer and not even literally technically true. Um, also, and in a more complicated way, not in schools where there are no resources to support another kind of decision. So it's all very well to say, okay, HTVs decide. But, um, you know, when everything is available in English only, um, you know, how, how do you make a decision unless there's support out there for the possibility of making another kind of decision? And unless there's discussion out there around the implications of making one decision or the other. Not also in terms of what I still think is, what I believe is still our language policy, although a long time since I've been to a school where people knew what the language policy was. Um, not according to academics who say, yes, um, you know, one decision, you know, SGBs can make the decision, but the, co the people who understand about language and learning say that we really need to understand what the consequences of one decision rather than another should be. So it's, they would, they would not like the idea, gen they do not like the idea generally of just saying, okay, you know, just decide which do you like better. They would much, much rather a situation in which, yes, parents do decide, but, but that it's a, a very informed decision. Um, so who decides? Well, I think the extent to which we find it difficult to imagine a world in which we together try to imagine the future of our children, the kind of society we live in, and the place of different languages in that society. The fact that we can't imagine talking about that together, having some kind of shared process of disagreeing with each other about it, not of agreeing, but of disagreeing with each other about it. That's what we've lost. Completely. Right. For well, the other questions, what she said. <laughs> I've got various hands shooting up. Clearly, the answers provoke more questions. So let me You've got time. The traffic's more crazy. I know. So I'm going to go for one more round of three questions or uh, comments. Keep it short. Keep it sweet, as I say. And then we'll start at the back, right at the back. In front to Sarah and then Renee, I think. I think that was all. Anybody on this side in front on the right? Okay, um, hi, uh, Sarah from UCT. I, I want to kind of foreground something Heather brought about responsibility by going to an example about health because I relate to that space as a citizen and not as an expert immersed in that and, and completely, um, completely embedded in that discourse. I was watching UTV News last night and I was struck that the death count of SC Demania has reached 140 plus. And here we have an example of a non-profit, public-private arrangement that has failed spectacularly. And watching this inquiry happening where 
the private, the non-profit part of the arrangement was literally saying to the commissioner, we were forced to take these patients and we had no choice in the matter. And it comes back to what Heather's trying to say about who is responsible for the decisions when things don't work out as they were intended. And how, who carries the can? But more importantly, I mean, in some respects, what Heather's trying to get at is that we are all responsible, either because we were ignorant of what was going on and we didn't hold this particular decision to account when it happened until it was too late and 140 people, the most vulnerable of our society, had already perished in horrible circumstances. But where are the legislative frameworks, where are the rules of engagement about how we take on those bad decisions? I think that's what I'm hearing Heather trying to say, is that we're not abdicating the responsibility, but some of these arrangements are happening in a way where the rules of engagement are at best confusing and at worst completely absent. And in that case then, responsibility becomes a very sticky issue. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Runei. Um, thank you very much for a very enlightening discussion um, and informative. Um, my comment slash question is about the word accountability, which whenever you hear public-private partnerships is probably the word that gets used the most. Um, but I'm curious about the kind of accountability it introduces, because for me, I've been grappling with this question about what exactly is a public institution? What is it when we're talking about public? And for me, one of the key things is the ability of citizens to somehow hold that institution accountable. And if you think about the accountability that often gets introduced when PPPs come into play, in schools, it's to hold teachers accountable. Um, it's not to hold people running the schools accountable, often. And when you ask, but how are these people who are holding teachers accountable being held accountable? The answer is a contract. They have a contract with government and that's how they're being held accountable. But for a how does a citizen hold that private operating partner or whatever you want to call that, how does a citizen hold uh, that uh, entity accountable? And for me, that is a big uh, issue around public-private partnerships. If you think about something like research, research in a public school is something that's governed by a whole process of applying to, to do research in a public school. Now, if you want to interrogate a private actor who's in this public school, you have no pro... That person can just say, I'm sorry, I'm not... I'm not responsible to you, I'm not going to speak to you. You know, so that's like, um, for me, at the heart of like, uh, the issue is how can citizens hold private actors accountable in a way that's not just through a contract with government in which you hardly have any say. Thank you. And, no one, and it's not in the public domain of it. I'll take the accountability question and then I realise I didn't really talk about structures which uh, Gilad had asked me to go deeper in relation to talking about context. I um, I'm, I've been, I am very interested and in, I've written about and thought about um, what's called in um, the kind of feminist literature um, velvet triangles. Velvet triangles are kind of feminist takes on the iron triangles, the corporatist iron triangles of capital, state and unions. And the velvet triangles looked at um, uh, feminist bureaucrats, which are sometimes called femocrats, a, a feminist movement, a social movement that took um, uh, engagement with a, a range of, of inequalities, and critical researchers. That's, a, the, that's the kind of velvet triangle. And the notion is that it's velvet because it's open um, to uh, the sort of what, what are often called considered the soft issues, but are in fact 
absolutely essential to the way in which we live. And I think it's that kind of notion, you know, accountability is so narrowly used in that example that you gave, you know, it's tied to the contract. Um, the relationship with government is tied to the, to the vote, or yes, maybe you might um, go and, uh, you, you buy the newspaper, we all talk about politics a huge amount, but our uh, capacities to intervene Yes, we are. Just, uh, yes, um, not uh, not very um, evident, but that notion of, 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 of so uh, my suggestion would be think about different sorts of triangles. It doesn't have to be a velvet triangle. Maybe it's the paper triangle around um, education, or maybe it's got anyway. Think think with that notion of triangles and where it might take, and and that brings me to why researchers are really important, because the discussion of context can be extremely superficial, as in that example of the, uh, the school and the language of instruction. And what the kind of researcher that public intellectual engagement, which tonight and the last two days examples we've had have been such a rich experience, is just scrutinizing, not taking anybody's words um, for granted, looking beneath them. and you know, really, really questioning and questioning from the point of view of where the experiences are very hard. Thanks. Yes, I'm also very interested in this notion of accountability and in fact it was in the back of my mind when I chose rather to use the word responsibility mm -hmm. earlier. Um, I, th I think we often blindly say we need to be accountable as if there's one meaning to, to that and it works in one way. There are many forms of accountability, there are many ways of configuring it. Mm. So one way is a, the kind of shared accountability and responsibility that I was trying to signal earlier, but that, that way also translates into accountability up and down a system. So if you think about something going wrong in a school, kids are failing, they're not learning. It's, let's imagine that scenario. Why is that happening? And who is accountable? And how do we hold them account, to account? And by what means? Um, well, first of all, it might be because of the way the teachers were trained or appointed or, or, or whether or not they, they, you know, there are teachers in that, in that particular subject or have knowledge of that particular subject. It might have a lot to do with what's going on in the environment, in the homes. It might have a lot to do with the curriculum at the time that actually, you know, the problems with it and it's, it's, it doesn't help the teachers to teach well um, in a whole lot of ways. Um, it might be to do with all sorts of economic circumstances. It, 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 lots of things impact on what happens at that point of contact between teacher and student. However, the way we have currently reconfigured the meaning of accountability is that teacher is responsible. And maybe the school. And that, that teacher and that school must report that via what? Via standardized assessments. That's how they, 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 whether or not they're doing their job is measured. And all the other stuff falls away and all the other levels of accountability. Have we got the right curriculum? You know, are we um, ensuring that kids arrive at the school able to learn, maybe having something in their stomach? Are teachers able to teach? Have we trained them appropriately or educated them appropriately? All these questions, you know, can teachers teach in the school where, in fact, if they come to the school, it's a thousand kilometers from where they want their own kids to go to school. Um, and they actually live 70 kilometers away in the, in the nearest town and come by taxi every day to the school and go back and if it's raining the taxi doesn't come. Whose fault is it? Can we just say it's the teacher's fault? It's got nothing to do with the rest of us. Um, the buses don't run, the buses fall down, the buses aren't provided. You know, whose fault is it that those kids aren't learning? So if we have this Accountability at the bottom, reported up via assessments that completely obliterates all these other things for which actually all sorts of other levels of the system are responsible, 
then I think we don't have a system of accountability. Mm -hmm. I think I will try to draw the seventh to end. I'm going to make three points. I think, you know, the, the interesting thing about academic debates is it always raises more questions than answers, which is good. But I'm going to say three things which I think are important that comes out. At the end, in all this complexity of who's accountable, whose voice, mustn't forget the fundamental point. A good public education relies on the government to be responsible and to be held accountable for. And I'm going to use this at Dimani as an example. It wasn't the failure of the NGOs, it was the failure of the state to make the choices it made. And the state should have been held accountable in that instance. In a democratic society, citizens give to the state the power to act on their behalf. That doesn't mean they mustn't have spaces to participate in all sorts of ways. But fundamentally, we must hold the government to account in all sorts of ways for the, both the delivery and the responsibility of education. If they choose to go down any other route, it's their responsibility. I think it would be complexify these issues, but fundamentally at the heart of good public education is a good government committed to the highest level of delivery. I think the other thing that's missing, we can have all sorts of debates about what is common, what is public, and we must. But at the heart of the debate is also we must state up front what is our vision of a just education system. Yeah. It's our vision that drives us. And the SDG, which I'm familiar with, states it's about equitable, inclusive, and quality and lifelong learning for all. It's equitable, it's inclusive, and it's socially just. I think whatever yardstick we use in any debates about whether public private party should work or does not work, it must be measured against for me a very simple benchmark. What impact does it have on the poorest and the most marginalized learners? In all the debates about what is common, what is public, what forms of governments we have, we must hold that vision into account. And the third thing we need to ask is, dialogue, community, participation is important, but not all voices are equal. Mm -hmm. And somehow you need to adjudicate between voices, and you need to make decisions between voices. Voices are as much partial and dishonest as they authentic and genuine. And I think we, mustn't valorize voice at the expense of recognizing voice is punctuated, voice is incomplete, and voice is dishonest as well. And so the appeal to the community and the collective is important, but it must be shaped by an understanding that whose voice counts and under what conditions it counts. Which all leads me to the argument that fundamentally the dialogue we're trying to have is both normative at the one level, what kind of society we'd like to see, and what kind of education system we want, but what is the evidence telling us in reaching there, and what is the ways and charts to get there. So it's one thing taking a vision, it's another thing. And that's been the value of this debate. So with those words, let me conclude by thanking you all, staying for college at 7 at night. I'd also like to thank the minister in particular for being present, because I think you know, I think it's very important that government engage at all levels and ministers engage. And the best governments are often those that listen to views that are contrary to their own. And that's really crucial because if you surround yourself as a leader, I learned that you should always have people who contradict you or who are smarter than you because then you look smart much better. Right? Um, so that's important. And I think it's so important that we do have these engagements because it percolates back into public debates. But it's also my final task to thank lots of people who have contributed. I think we'd like to thank our international participants who have really engaged with us for two days and will continue to engage with us. I think we'd like to thank a lot of people who are behind the scenes made these days very possible. So that starts with people like Tom, Taran, Nimi, Bashira, Fahri, and Lynette from from my side, I'd like to thank the rest of the site team who's always been there, who put up with my frustrations and irritations as much as my pushing 
to make dialogue and research an important part of what we do. I'd also like to thank CPUT and the CNA management who are occupied but who are committed, I think, to the kinds of engagement we have. So thank you all. And I'd like to thank Jasmine Gideon in particular because the Equips Network is what brought us here together in the first place and helped this dialogue to happen. So thank you, Jasmine. <laughs> Obviously, in particular, the, our, a strong partnership we have between Rhodes, UCT, and CPUT side. This is a long, ongoing collaboration. We've not always agreed, but we've agreed on the need for dialogue and advocacy around what is good in public education. Because ultimately, we, in the research, we're committed to making our evidence available for what makes sense to improve and to, for us all to collectively undertake the long march through public education for those who need it most. So thank you all for coming. Have a wonderful evening, and by now the traffic starts. So thank you.